So thanks again for coming this afternoon. I see some new faces in the audience. So welcome, this is the Global Engagement Seminar Summit, and we have the second keynote. Her name is Mimi Onoha, who is the uh, Yaroslavsky Fellow for 2019. Mimi is a Nigerian-American, Brooklyn-based media artist and researcher. Her work uses code, writing, interventions, and objects to explore missing data, AI-based technologies, and the ways in which people are abstracted, represented, and classified. Mimi has been in residence at iBeam Art and Technology Center, Studio XX, is that how you say that? Studio XX, the Data and Society Research Institute, Columbia University's Toe Center, and the Royal College of Art. In 2014, she was selected to be in the inaugural class of the Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellows. So welcome. Thank you very much for all the time that you've spent with our students and for facilitating some of the projects. I know they've all been really excited to work with you. So come on up. Hello, everyone. It is really nice to be here. Um, I just want to start by saying thanks to, let me see if I can get everyone, to Jasmine and Ian, Marcel, um, Doug, Ina, Donnie, David, everyone, and of course all the students, uh, the students in this Global Engagement Seminar who have been really wonderful. Can I just get a show of hands from all the students in the, great, okay. Hello all of you, thank you so much. It was, it's so good seeing your faces in person. It's so much better than seeing them just over a screen. It's, I can't even tell you. So it's good to see all of you. Uh, and also, a quick caveat for y'all, a lot of this is taken from the presentations that I made to your class, so some of this will be stuff you've already heard, but I've tried to add in some new things, so hopefully you won't be too bored. And the other thing I will say, perhaps you can tell, I am feeling a little bit ill, so please have some patience with me. I usually would have way more energy than I do right now, I promise, uh, but I'm just a little under the weather. So I wanna begin this with a story. Uh, it's a story I've told many times before. It's a story I already told all the students. Uh, but it's one that I'm looking at kind of differently these days. Because I think sometimes you have to tell a story many, many times before you can really understand what it's saying. So this is a story. Uh, it's a story I published for Quartz, which is this digital publication. And the meat of it is kind of in the title. It says, side-by-side -side images expose a glitch in Google's Maps. And I wrote this when I was a data journalist working for Quartz, uh, and this talks about how for all of the location-based data that Google has, there are still these spots that show up as blank. So here's an example. This is the first one, it's from Nigeria. That's where I'm from. This is off the coast of Lagos. This is Makoko, it's this floating lake community. So you can see on one side of it, we get the satellite imagery, and then on the other side, we get the actual map data. And uh, when it comes back around, you'll see that none of really any of the, the people or any of the places that are on the coast actually show up on here. Here is another example. This is from Chad. Uh, this is one part of a much, much larger area. This is kind of one place that really highlights this. You see once again, virtually invisible. Continuing our trend, now we're in Mongolia. Uh, and we, we see pretty much the same, same story going on here. And then we get to uh, the final one, which is my favorite one, which I will tell you why later on. But this is uh, in the heart of Rio. This is one of the favelas. And this one, I, I can kind of see, I don't know, maybe you can tell that actually of all of them, this one shows up the most. So you can still see a few kind of places when it slides over again. Uh, it shows up the most out of any of them. So the question is what is happening here? And what I always like to say when I talk about this is that the immediate temptation is to think, uh, to fall into this narrative of thinking that this big company, Google, is trying to erase all of these people, and that is not what's happening here. We know this for two reasons. One of them is that Google tried, I'm gonna use Rio, Google has tried really hard to map a lot of these areas. They've even built special equipment. They've partnered with uh, nonprofits on the ground. They've tried really hard to map a lot of these areas, but in um, Rio in particular still, only 2% of the favelas are mapped. We also know this isn't the case because it's not just Google that has mapping data. There are other places we can go that also have data, places like OpenStreetMap uh, and other sites, and we see pretty much the same story, at least at the time of making this. Uh, and so, really, what I wanna use this presentation uh, to do is to really unravel what's happening in all of these, 
Because I think that we can use these, this series of examples as a way of, we can use them as a lens into thinking about AI in particular, but also thinking about the ways in which data, emerging technologies, uh, and how these things are uniquely and differently interwoven in our society in ways that range from mundane to being quite significant and altering. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of the time here is focus on these maps and tease out what is significant behind and within them. But I am an artist and researcher, and so the way that I make sense of topics is really multivariate. I write, oh, I don't want, I don't want the audio, actually. <laughs> I write, you don't need to hear me talking even more. Um, right, I make physical work. I, I do just a number of things. I teach workshops. Uh, I just teach in general. Uh, so what I wanna do is use my past work as a, way, as a way to think through why I find those spots on the map so captivating. Um, and to also be clear, this entire symposium is about AI, it's about artificial intelligence. I think David did a really good job of giving us an overview and definition of AI. But I come at things from the side of data. I'm an artist who works with data, and this might seem like it's a bit of a tangent, but actually, data is the thing that is really most, I would say, you can argue, deeply responsible for the recent burst in AI uh, advances and the fact, that we live, the fact that we live in this world of unprecedented data collection right now is very much tied to, to artificial intelligence and the fact that we talk about AI all the time. Uh, so Mitchell Whitelaw, who's this Australian academic, often says that data are measurements extracted from the flux of the real, and I, I quite like that definition. So number of trees in Waterloo, average income of residents in this area, click-through rate on videos, all of these are data sets. Uh, but I, you know, there's more, of course those are data sets, but increasingly we ourselves are being made into data as well through things like facial recognition, biometric data collection. And while a lot of people like to focus on data and what that means, a lot of my work actually uh, takes place at an earlier point. I'm less interested in what data does and how it can be analyzed, and I'm more interested in the data collection process. And that's because for me, I think of data less as a beginning point, but more as an ending point. Uh, and I think that doing that actually helps us see, helps us like tease through the seeming neutrality of data sets. And I think it just really allows for us to n like not forget that data isn't a natural resource, that it actually has to be collected and it appears from a set of conditions and from a context. Uh, and I think that this really allows us to consider differently all of these data-driven technologies, which eventually will get us back to AI. Uh, so I will give you an example of how I actually started thinking about this. this is a project that, I can't remember, was it, who, was it Marcel who shouted this out yesterday? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's for you. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna do this by talking about this project I worked on many, many years ago. It's not really a project, it's more of an intervention, but, and I actually did not think I would still be talking about it at this point in my career, but strangely, I still find it really useful. This is a project called Star 69. Uh, this takes place on, um, on the streets, I suppose. This is from 2013. When I was living in New York, and I, uh, it was summer, it was really hot, I was getting catcalled a lot. And I think, David, you talked about your, your coworker making that cat, thing, like having a, a problem with the cats so and then designing this complicated system to try to deal with it rather than like going and talking to the person. Perhaps a similar, similar case. <laughs> um, so I was getting catcalled a lot and I really didn't like it. I didn't like specifically how I felt when someone catcalled me. What, and what I mean by how I felt, what I mean is that I hated that they walked away and they felt cool and didn't really think about it, but I was always like, oh, I don't, ooh, this is annoying. Like, should I do something, does this matter, I don't know. So what I started doing was whenever somebody would cat call me, I would give them a phone number, I would give them a piece of paper with my phone number on it, but it actually wasn't my phone number, of course, it was actually hooked up, I used this API system and I hooked it up to the server so that whenever uh, somebody texted the number, they couldn't call it, but whenever they texted it, they would get a string of pre-programmed messages. So I will show you an example, you have to imagine. <laughs> So you just have to imagine, I'm walking down the street, somebody says something, I go up to them, I give them a piece of paper with my phone number on it, and they text something like this. Hi gorgeous, beautiful day, isn't, I think the it is implied. So this is the one I always show, this is the most intense message I sent, and also this project is from years ago, so here it is, I wish you knew how terrible your actions make me feel. It's a little overwrought, but that is the one that got chosen, and then this is the response. My apologies, what should I take a look at? And it won't happen again. So that's nice. That is the only one I ever show because it's the nicest one I ever got. <laughs> All of the other responses were way worse and not appropriate for a presentation. So I don't ever show them. 
But the point is, I did this over the course of the summer, and by the end of the summer, I had something like this. This is not the actual thing, this is a representation. But apparently, it was this um, catcaller database. I basically had a data set of all of the phone numbers of everybody who had catcalled me over the summer, who I had given this piece of paper to. And this is the contentious moment of the project. This is the climax. This is when something is supposed to happen. And this is, the, you could argue that this is the moment that makes this not a piece, not an artwork, but just an intervention. Uh, and that is because you get this question of what now? What do I do? Now I have all their phone numbers. What do I do? Do I like spam them all? Or do I send them like Audrey Lord readings? Or do I, you know, what, what am I supposed to do with it? And the answer is that I did nothing. And the reason I did nothing is because I found that something had changed. The moment, I, I hadn't set out to create this database, or this data set, I should say, but actually I had, and it was this artifact, uh, but I was really confused because for me, the most important part of the piece was not that. It was everything that had led up to it. So it was this like weird threat and having to walk up to people and hand them this piece of paper. Uh, it was the strange like intimacy of this relationship where we, they think we're texting each other even though we're really not. Uh, and so even though this is a technologically mediated relationship, it, there's something that exists there. So I, there was, for me to focus on the data set was to miss the entire story of everything else that had been created before it. And so that is what I got really consumed by rather than doing anything with the data. And that is what kind of led me to this first big takeaway of my like, data-driven art career, which was this, this idea that data sets are artifacts and that they are artifacts that come from a relationship and from a process. And I say, doing this, I think, this, this idea of the relationship is really good because I think it gets at agency and motivation behind data sets. And so a data set is, I think, is always composed, particularly social data sets, of some entity that wants to collect something and then some entity that makes up the collected. And often that relationship is severed. You don't really see it. People just, we just talk about data as existing. But actually every data set comes into, comes into being from a purpose, from somebody's desire. And reinserting the relationship uh, actually allows us to see that. But I think this process aspect is also really important because it can explain a lot about a data set. So. These are two different you students, you'll remember this. These are two different numbers. This is the number of hate crimes that happen in 2013 in the United States. Uh, these are wildly different no numbers, you may notice, uh, but they're for the same year. And then the question that kind of begs is why are they so different? And the answer is in the collection process. So the first uh, data set comes from the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program. Uh, in the US, this is a program that works with the FBI checking in on police departments who have had people report hate crimes to them or have been sent out to investigate hate crimes. The second one comes from our department, US, the Department of Justice, Department of Justice's Bureau of Statistics. And that is a survey that is sent around to people. So it's not mediated by anyone else. You can just fill it out if, you, if a hate crime has occurred against you. And so you can see there's a big difference in the number of hate crimes that you get depending on how you actually uh, measure this. <coughs> So the very way in which these different data sets are collected actually changes the content of them. So this isn't just a, like a fun thing to remember, this is actually crucial to understanding any data set is deeply investigating and interrogating the collection process. So the numbers that I uh, just showed you actually came from this piece that I wrote when I was at the Data, data and Society Research Institute in New York, which is a research institute devoted to exactly what it says, data and society. Uh, and data and society has this publication called Points, and so uh, most of us wrote something for it. So this is the piece I wrote for it. Where in the, and in this piece, I articulated some of my sort of emerging thoughts around data collection. And here is one thing that I said in the piece, which is that as we collect more data, we prioritize things that fit patterns of collection. And in this, what I was trying to say was how it's not just that data sets emerge from a relationship and a process, but that there's this strange circularity that occurs when you live in a society uh, that is supported or built on top of computers and where it is very always like profitable to be collecting data and to have things take the shape of data, to be collecting data and to have things take the shape of data, that there become this strange circularity emerges from it, where then you have to prioritize things that fit data, and then your problems have to be tied to things that fit data. And this also, we can have a conversation later on about proxy data sets and how important they are and how under-discussed they are in terms of how we understand the world. But, of course, not everything can be made into data. So at this point in uh, my career, this is sort of when I switched and started working on this project that I've still, I'm still working on to this day. Right now, it sort of um, has ebbs and flows, I would say. 
started working on this in 2015, and nowadays I would say it's like almost on in background and mute, but then sometimes I turn on the volume. This is a project called uh, Missing Data Sets. That's sort of the broad name for it. And the way that this project started was as a repo on GitHub. I don't know if y'all know, but GitHub is a site for sharing code. As I was telling the students, I really like to use GitHub for not sharing code. I like to use it for sharing pretty much anything else <laughs> other than code uh, because it's just a nice kind of space that's in between public and private, but people can sort of comment and change and adjust what you're saying. And so in 2015, I published, uh, made this repo, this repository on missing data sets. And what I said at the time is that missing data sets were blank spots in otherwise data saturated areas. So you'd have an area where loads of data are being collected, and then all of a sudden you'd have this very curious blank spot where you can't see anything being collected. And so I started this, uh, this whole project trying to investigate that, and the, way, the best way that I could think of, of how to do that was to actually start by just making a list of missing data sets. So this is the list I made at that time, what I'm gonna show you next. It's not up to date, but this was how I began. It was just by listing all of these different data sets. And they have sort of ranged, some of them are more serious, some of them are a bit more uh, silly. But I realized at this point, after I had been just creating this list on my own, it's sort of public, semi-publicly, I realized that actually I was doing, I was doing, the op was doing the exact thing that I had been invalidating in earlier work, which is that rather than focusing on, uh, I was sort of highlighting the data sets but instead of focusing on what went on behind them. And so then I switched at that point. And rather than focusing on just creating missing data sets, I started looking at patterns of absence instead. So what I mean by that is the things but that inform missing data sets. So why are things missing in the first place? This is what I call the pattern of absence. And at the time, I sort of came up with these four different reasons for why data sets are missing. And I will say these kind of overlap Obviously, nothing is, nothing is so easy. Uh, you'll see that missing data sets sort of fall between these four different categories. But here, here's the first one. And this is just that those with resources lack the incentive to collect. And vice versa, sometimes those who have the incentive to collect a data set will lack the resources to actually do that. And the, the example that really started me down this entire rabbit hole was at the time that I was doing it, there were a lot of black Americans being killed by the police, and I just was so surprised that we didn't have any national database or data set really for civilians killed by the police. I just, and now we do have that. I will say this isn't a missing data set, which is another thing we can talk about, what happens when things stop being missing. We can maybe work it out in the Q&A. Uh, but at the time, that was something that I, uh, that I found really interesting. And then I started to see that there was this, there was this differential. In fact, law enforcement agents could be, should be the ones to collect that because they are the ones who sort of create that data set, but there, there is no incentive to collect that. And you see this across the board with so many different things. Uh, one recent one, I've been talking with people at Rikers, and there's a lot of data about Rikers Island, um, prison in, in New York, and there's a lot of data about prisoner on prisoner violence and prisoner on guard violence, but nothing on guard on prisoner violence. So this, this difference between resources and incentives and who can collect. Uh, there's uh, so many, there's so, so many data sets fall into this. Uh, one that I sometimes talk about is stingrays in the US, which are cellular, which are devices that emulate cellular towers that a lot of law enforcement agents will use so that they can kind of get metadata from people's cell phones without them realizing. And we know that a lot of we know a lot of departments have them, but the public doesn't know who, who has them. Uh, but again, we, should, we could know. But there's this, this kind of gap between those resources and incentives. The second reason why you will sometimes have missing data sets is this, which is that the act of collection can sometimes take more than it gives. So the burden to collecting something can be higher than the perceived value of having that data set. And the example I always, always use with this is any data set really around sexual, har sexual harassment, sexual assault. There are, again, we can have more conversations about all of these later on, uh, but this, the act of actually coming forth and reporting is so high, the burden of doing that is so high that it's enough to prohibit people from wanting to come forward. And there are, again, there are so many different data sets that fit into this category as well. And this gets at that highlighting the collection process as part of the data, the data process that allows you to be able to see for these kind, of, these kind of differences. The third one is probably the most technical one, which is just that a lot of data resist metrification. And then I mean that there are a lot of things that we actually can't datafy, that we can't quantify, 
and then for that reason they just don't fit. And the example I like to use for this one because it's not one that you would think is actually cash. Cash is really interesting to me. I've spent a lot of time talking to statisticians and ec economists about cash outside, particularly American dollars outside of the US's borders because there is no way to count any of that. And it's this thing that economists talk about every like four years or so somebody comes out with a paper where they're like, we still don't know. <laughs> We don't know how to even know, but we can we can guess. Like here, we this is how we can we can reliably start to estimate. But actually, we we really don't know entirely. Had a lot of interesting conversations with folks about this, and I find this really relevant because we are moving into a time of more and more credit-based transactions, which makes total sense when you think about the world. Like I said, data roughly is money, and if you can track transa transactions, that is way better, way more profitable than not being able to track them. And then the fourth, the final reason is a little bit tricky. And it's that sometimes there are benefits to a data set not existing. And the reason I say this is tricky is because in fact, all of any missing data set, there are benefits to it not existing. But I think what I, what I mean with this is that specifically, sometimes the people who have less power in a situation, sometimes they benefit from not having a data set exist. There's uh, a lot to say, the like, kind of typical example I use for this is around undocumented immigrants, uh, not just in the US, really, around the world, that there's, there are, I've done projects working with loads of people who actually want to collect some kind of data, then we find out that really in collecting it, there would be these harms for them. So they say, actually, it's better for us to not be, not be collected. There are also, you can see a lot of examples with this in municipal identification cards. Uh, there, I don't know, I don't know how this conversation is happening in Canada, but I know in the US, there is this sort of ongoing conversation around creating municipal ID cards for people who are undocumented, and in creating the card, if you collect data and save the data, or if you don't, because if you don't save it, then you can actually, that's actually a move of protection against people who are undocumented, but if you do save it, that means that someone can come and demand it. So this is what I mean when I say these benefits to non-existence, specifically for people who are situationally disadvantaged. So, <coughs> sorry. So while I was at Data and Society, I was really fleshing out this as a research project and sort of writing about it uh, and thinking in that way, but I have I told you I'm an artist, so I work in a lot of different ways, and so there is an aspect of the entire Missing Data Sets project that involves working with folks who come to me and say that they are missing data. So I will tell one of those stories. This is a group of uh, Asian American Broadway performers, if there are any Broadway fans, any Broadway, you know, I won't make you out yourself, don't worry. Um, anyway, these are <laughs> Broadway performers, and they, uh, they realized, they started to suspect that they were not getting rates, they were not getting roles at the same rate as some of, some of their counterparts uh, in, in Broadway and in theater, and in off-Broadway as well. So they started to go, they talked to a lot of people, they talked to theater agents, and they talked to like nonprofit uh, theaters, and off, sorry, off-Broadway theaters and Broadway producers. And the general reaction that they got was, we don't think that this is true, so like, don't really worry about this. And so they thought, okay, well, maybe we should try to collect some data about this. So this is, to me, a very interesting, really interesting example, because this is a, like, they are performers, and so they also know a lot of the Broadway performers. And so it's this rare example where you can get this almost complete closed uh, like data set, because they, they know the field that they're in, and they know a lot of those people. And so they started collecting data, and they started going back and trying to figure out specifically the, the ethnicity and race of performers on Broadway, because that is a thing that they could not find anything for. So they started doing this, they did this for a while, and then I got linked up with them. And when I got linked up with them, I sort of helped them use this framework of missing data as a way of thinking through it, and then help them do a lot of data analysis around the project. And then wrote this article, at the time I was still at Quartz, uh, doing data journalism stuff for them, and so wrote this article about the, exact, the entire experience. In this article, what we did was we released all of the data they'd collected over the five years, and then we did a bunch of different analyses, and we explained some of the very like, intense particularities of this particular, of how thinking about data in the course of Broadway and roles, but I always just show really one, one chart. And it's the one that I think just sums this up the best. So this is a chart, 2014-15 season on Broadway, new Broadway shows. The light blue color is Asian Americans. And maybe you will see that they only show up in one show for the 2014-15 season. That show is The King and I, which is set in modern day Thailand and which has white main characters. So actually they were, they were kind of right. <laughs> This goes to say, uh, and then something I did like to say when I talk about this is that there's, in the Broadway scene, we looked, because we looked at all of this data and we, had a, we went through a lot of it, 
uh, we started to see that there's a strain, the way that shows kind of work on Broadway is that just like this, where you will have a show that is like an Asian show, like The King and I, and that will just have a, a lot of Asians in it. And then you'll have like a black show, which is Holler If You Hear Me, which is a Tupac musical, which was very short lived. And that has, that's the show that has mostly uh, black people in it. And then the rest of the shows are pretty much white shows. That's sort of how Broadway works, with the exception, at least in the data we looked at, of one show, which is Hamilton. It's the only one that actually interrupts that. So that's just a side note. It was interesting. Uh, but this was probably the neatest example of this project I can think of in that a group said they were missing some data, they wanted to collect it, they did, now they have it. And if you ask them, in the follow-ups when I talk to them, they say things have gotten better. Again, another thing we can talk about, whether they have, this what happens once you get the data. Uh, but they, they say things have gotten better. And so it's a very straightforward and very compelling narrative. Like there's missing data and now they have it. But actually that's not really the point of the project and that's not really all of these cases. And so that's why there's sort of this, I have this third aspect of the project which is just an art understanding of it. And this is it, this is, uh, this is a piece. This is called The Library of Missing Data Sets. This is a showing of this in a gallery in, I think this is in the Netherlands. Uh, and this piece consists of a filing cabinet, and the filing cabinet has all of these folders inside of it, and the folders are titled with names of missing data sets. And all of the data sets, I've shown this in many different places now, but the data sets are related to wherever it is being shown. So when it was shown in the Netherlands, a lot of them were like very European and Netherlands related uh, data sets, whereas this, I think, was, this photo I think is from New York. And uh, what I really like about this piece is, that, there are a number of things I like about it. One thing I like is that it does this thing that art allows you to do, which is sort of present something in a way that you can like, get the feels, the contours of an argument without having to like, have it made at you. And so something I like is how in the presentation of it, you start to see this, the patterns of absence without those being like, uh, listed out, you start to get a sense of them. But the other thing I really like is that depending on how it's shown, um, sometimes it's shown in a way where you can touch it, other times it's shown in a way where you can't. Uh, but when you can, it is really an interesting experience to watch people engage with it. And really, they sort of like rifle through the folders and they lift them up. And there's always a moment where they open it and then they're like, right, missing, it's empty. <laughs> I get it. And it's just really, it's really wonderful seeing that process of discovery happen as they're looking at the piece. Uh, something, so that's this version of it. This is, as I said, it's been shown in a lot of different places. And as I said, I try to change it so that it's related to the actual place that it's shown. But something else I do as an artist is that I like to remake pieces. I like to do pieces multiple times to try to tease out different elements of them. And so most, a lot of the pieces I've made, I've done, I have like version one, version two, version three, sort of like an alpha beta and then release. But uh, the, the second version of this piece was for this exhibition, which took place in San Francisco. And this one was sort of different because it was specifically about the black experience with data. And I wanted, with this exhibition, this just happened, or I guess it didn't, I guess we're in April now. This happened earlier this year. This was in January and it was extended, so it was for most of the month of January. But this one, I tried to do a different version of the piece because, um, well, I'll just show it. So this is the next, the other version of the piece. This is the second Library of Missing Data Sets version two. And this is specifically for this uh, context because what I, it's the same piece but it's gold. And what I wanted to hint at was this idea of just when it comes to data sets in America and black Americans, black Americans being the, the object of collection but not really the subject in many cases. So it goes back to that, that relationship around collection that I was talking about. And so trying to hint at this idea of wealth extraction. And so that's, that's what this piece looks like. And so what I think, the entire Missing Data Sets project, one thing that I really pull away from it is this idea, which is that data reveals power. And in their upcoming book, Lauren, Lauren Klein and Catherine Dignazio talk, uh, they have an upcoming book called Data Feminism, and they talk about how data is power, and I think that is, that's a, you know, an interesting and good point. But I'm saying something different, I'm saying data reveals power, uh, which is that, I mean that data is one of many, many ways through which power is expressed and kind of sorted out. And uh, this is, I don't know if you know, Stuart Hall, really just wonderful uh, British Jamaican cultural theorist, has this wonderful quote about culture where he says, I think culture is very important, more than important, it's absolutely constitutive. But it's also one among many other things, how could you not be also interested in capital or war and be alive today? Of course, culture isn't everything, but culture is a dimension of everything. So we can't quite just take out the word culture and insert data in this quote. That doesn't really work entirely. But there is one part where I think it does really work. Uh, and it's with this part. 
constitutive. He says, I think culture is very important. It's absolutely constitutive. And I think the same thing about data. I think data constitutes. I think it composes, it forms, it creates. It creates and forms groups and it creates and forms people. So we've already debunked this idea that data sets just exist in the world and uh, we've talked about how it's people and groups who bring it together for some kind of specific purpose. And so then now this brings us to the next question which is how, how are people constituted through data? Another way of asking this would be how does a group become a we through data? Here's one example. I showed y'all already in this class. Maybe y'all can, if you look at it, I don't know if you can figure out what it is. Any guesses? No people from the class, y'all already know. Spoilers, nope. Okay, uh, so this is, this is scraped by Sam Levine, who's a media artist in New York. And this is Twitter's ad create, this is from Twitter's ad creation page. And it is a list of all the categories that people are sorted into for advertising purposes. This is uh, obviously not the entire list. This is just one segment of a much, much, much longer list. Uh, and then you can see on the left-hand side at the time of his scraping how many people actually fit into that category. And what is always interesting to, things, interesting to me about this list is how granular it is. So you'll see there's buyers of cheese, which is different than buyers of milk, which is different than buyers of dairy products and eggs. Those are all different groups. And then there's also, uh, within people who live within five miles of any CVS store, which is different, that that's a drugstore, which is different than within five miles of any Walgreens drugstore, and then I think there's one more of any, and then households within five miles of any Rite Aid drugstore. This is a really, uh, I like this list because it does speak very much to this business model of the web, um, but it also speaks about to how data and digital platforms constitute or form us into groups without us being aware of that, and how those groups go on to play a very important role in the way that we use the web, but again, without us really knowing that that is happening. But there are other ways of classifying people, uh, some that we see, but also may not recognize. So this is, this is a photo of my mom. I know, she looks great. This is before we really came around. <laughs> we were there, but you know, you can tell. She's happier. So this, <laughs> that's my mom. And then this is a photo of all the people who have been classified by Google's image uh, recognition algorithms as being similar to my mom. So this is, this is super banal, this is a system that many people use every day without thinking about. This is just Google's, Google's images. And that's really the point uh, of this, I think, is that we don't think in many ways about the ways in which the world around us is shaped and the ways in which these socio-technical forces and like big companies can act, how, the ways that they can very subtly shape the world and group us into different ways. I've always believed that when you get a new piece of technology, you have a few years to make sense of it and to really define the terms of it. But how does that change when you're not really aware of how that's being rolled out or what those terms should be? So this, um, this became the fodder for a piece that I made in 2017 and that I'm in the process of remaking called Us Aggregated. This is like a taste of it. It's actually, uh, this is in the form that it's gonna be exhibiting, exhibiting in May, again in San Francisco. Uh, and really, this is like a 15 minute long video. You've got fam photos from my family's archives on the left hand side, and then you've got all of the um, similar things uh, on the right hand side. And there's also this, this little thing that happens, I'll start at the beginning because you can see it better, is that they're actually, these photos have been tagged. So you can see this one on the left, it says that's dad's chief ceremony, but then, because uh, Google also does this thing where they like, classify the image, and so this says community, so you can also see that, uh, and so as I said, this is, the actual piece is this long, like 15 minute video that takes you through all of these different uh, things. So there's something here, we're talking about power, and what I'm trying to get at really with this piece is the ways in which how, in reflecting the world, Google is also shaping the world, but how that is so quiet and so like stuck into, just put into, like packaged into a, to this tool that we don't really think about. So. I think about this a lot, the things that are packaged into the, the tools that we use. And as I said, the, what is so compelling to me is how banal this kind of seems. There's a poetry to this grid of images, I think, and it really obscures what's happening beneath it, which isn't even really insidious in any way, is normal, and that's kind of the point. This is another, I told you I like to think through things, through art pieces, this is another uh, example. It's really engaging with some of the same themes. This is called Classification 01, it's from 2018. Also, it's gonna be shown this year in a museum in Contemporary Arts Museum somewhere. <laughs> I can't remember. Sorry, I'm still feeling sick. Arizona, that's it. Um, and so this is actually, these are brackets. These are made of neon. 
and you can't see it in this documentation um, image, but actually the way that the piece is, is really presented, uh, this is kind of like more of what you would see. The way that this works is that it's, it's a sculpture that consists of two neon brackets, uh, and usually there, there's actually supposed to be a camera that's in the middle of this. This is like our documentation shot. But what happens is that the, uh, when more than one viewer approaches the piece, I have this camera and I've kind of written a bunch of different algorithms that decide whether the people who are looking at the piece are similar to each other. And if the people are classified as similar, then it lights up. And that's it, and then it stays lit for a little while. Uh, and then it kind of slowly sort of dims itself. And then when more people come in, once again, if it perceives them to be uh, like similar, then it will light up. And so then you've got this thing where the people who are viewing it are left with this odd experience of having been classified as similar. But of course, it doesn't tell the terms for that. It doesn't tell you why you've been classified as similar. And so people are kind of left to guess at that, or if they want to not really think about it. And part of this is really meant to be a reminder uh, of just this like, that strange, I don't know, the opacity of this process, which is unfolding all of the time, and the strange emptiness of not knowing the terms of your own classification or your own uh, categorization. So that, like I said, that's this third point, which is that the process of data creation also constitutes, it constitutes us. It's not just this power, it also has these effects. So the ability, it's this ability to use this, this we, like who is this we? And I'll kind of tease this out a little bit later. But these are sort of the three things that I've kind of like gotten through in the, in the, over this presentation. One is that these data sets are an artifact of a relationship and process. Two, data's power, it simultaneously reveals power. And three, that the process of data creation puts people into groups. So now I think armed with all of this, we can sort of return to the beginning. We can return to our initial question and say what is happening here? So, these are places that don't count as data. We can start, let's start here. This data sets are artifacts of a relationship and a process. So these are places that don't really count as data. Uh, and this tells us something. This is how geographic data collection is done. Uh, and what happens, how ge geographic data collection is based on a certain conception of what space is like uh, and what makes space legible. And so these places, the places that show up here in the background, none of them are really legible to our systems of data collection. That might be because they're remote, they lack a certain type of infrastructure. Uh, some of them are impermanent, some of them are informal. Uh, some of them are very high context, to use a different phrase. They resist categorization. Uh, and, but then there's also this question now of like who they resist categorization to. So I think as we're thinking about, I told you I'm gonna connect this back to AI. As we're thinking about AI and about the proliferation of AI-based technologies, we have to consider what happens to these places that can't be made into data. What does that result in? Then we get to the second thing about data's power and data reveals power. So I have talked a lot about Google in this presentation. I know we made a joke yesterday that they're the only company not represented, so we can pick on them. But I'm actually not really picking on Google. That is not my position. I think Google, you know, I actually am funded by Google right now, so I, I am really not hating on them. What I'm really talking about is this, um, this question less of intention and just of who has power and how do, who gets to define the world. I don't think this is any of Google's fault. Google did not go into the mapping world, uh, into the mapping space to be able to expressly like in, out of any political desire, I assume. <laughs> but regardless, there is a political aspect to this, to, to what's happening here. And this is also a story of the ubiquity of Google's data systems and what it means to not show up on Google's systems. What does that cut you off from? <coughs> so there's, there's something here, like I said, if we have more time, we can tease out like Google being a representative of mostly Western and like Global North systems and how that affects the world where you can sort of start to notice where are all these places located. There are, there are other things that we can tease out in this, but just that the very nature of like large companies having this sort of power, that implies something and that something is political, whether it is intended to be or not. And then this third point about how data, the process of data creation puts people into groups, how it constitutes people. So what is interesting to me about these spaces is how though they really don't, they can't, they don't fit this datafication of the world, they still are deeply, deeply affected by it. And in fact, precisely because they can't be mapped, they then become constituted as a people who are defined by that, in a, that inability to fit that system. So uh, this has ramifications, and we know this because of this. This is the way that I actually found out about this article. Uh, this, Ronaldo Lemos is a Brazilian academic, and he wrote this article uh, about how when Pokemon Go first came out, nobody in the favelas in Rio could play. Now, the reason for this is because Pokemon Go, the company that makes it, Niantic Inc., they uh, were kind of uh, incubated within Google, and so they used Google's mapping data, 
as the, plat as the underlying uh, like kind of baseline for the game. So if you don't show up in Google's Maps, then there's a game that's based on top of Google's geographic data. Of course, you're not going to show up in that either. So uh, what I find really interesting about this is that this is a really like frivolous example because it seems like it's just about a game, but it kind of hints at something at something bigger. This is what I mean when I say that the ability, like the not being defined, like that then makes you into a group and then you are affected by this. You can already see it in something so simple as this. But then of course, what Ronaldo Lemos writes about, he's like, okay, well, obviously self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles are not going to, they're not going to work in, in the favelas, they're not going to work in Mokoko. Like these areas are cut off from that as well. So in summation, I think these spaces reveal not just the ways in which data is limited or unlimited, but how we have, like, we have to consider the world as data is beginning to shape it and how data collection is beginning to shape it. Beginning, I should say, continuing. <laughs> So then the question might be like, is there, is there a response? I told you everything that I said was eventually going to come back to AI. Now's the time when I'm gonna do that. Um, I don't know if this counts as a response, but this is sort of what I've been, one of the things I've been thinking through lately. Uh, something I talked about with a lot of the students is this uh, guide that I made with my collaborator, Diana Nucera. It's called A People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. And it is this, it's a comprehensive beginner's guide to understanding AI and other data-driven systems. It uses a popular education, it's supposed to be a footnote to Paulo Freire, popular education, approach to explore and explain AI-based technologies so that everyone has a chance to think critically about the kinds of futures automated technologies can bring. So something Diana and I talked about was this, if people are constituted by technologies, then maybe AI can be an example of this, that it's constitutive in terms of who uses it, who can talk about it, who, can, who speaks to AI bias, who is spoken to, who like, like is affected by these things. And then if that's the case, can we then use that and like use that constitution of people who maybe don't feel like they like fit into conversations around it and say, all right, well then that's a group, we'll speak directly to them. So this is, um, that's me. <laughs> On the other side is Diana, I just wanna make sure I kind of shout out Diana because Diana does really great work in Detroit uh, where 40% of people don't have internet access and she works with um, setting up various like wireless networks so that those people can be uh, connected. And so a lot of us, we both in different ways are engaged with people who aren't tech experts. Uh, and so we became really interested in what it would look like to have this like emerging technology under explained in a way that people who aren't, who aren't able to take a course like this can still have access to that language. Sorry, so we've been leveraging these ways. And so we have this glossary of terms that we include in it. We've got, we talk about ways in which you can see AI. We talk about what an algorithm actually is. We spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, talk about places where AI shows up. Talk about the difference between AI and machine learning. We also have these workbook exercises because we just worked a lot with people and realized some people are not as interested in just reading and actually want something where they can like, respond to. So we developed this as we were also like, doing workshops and meeting with people who like, wanted to talk about these things. And then of course we also talk a lot about equity and we talk about like the sort of social aspect behind a lot of this. And part of the reason we did that is because we realized that that's how a lot of people enter the space. And uh, I should say specifically, I think a lot of people, Tyana and I, like people assume that we're talking like specifically to black and brown people and we're really not in this guide. We're talking to people who do not, uh, who don't identify as experts in AI. So that, those are like the groups that we worked with. And even still, this question of equity and fairness kept coming up with every group that we talked about. And so we really had to just bake this into the guide. We wanted it to be not that it's something on top, where it's like, oh, first you learn the technical and then we like engage in some thinking about uh, what, what this means, but rather that you can learn these things side by side and maybe that's, that's a useful thing. And then we end, of course, on this note of efficacy, because it's really easy to end on depressing notes uh, when you talk about big tensions inherent in AI, and we had no desire, no desire to do that at all. So this is, this is where I'm gonna end us today. <laughs> Thank you all uh, for sitting with me through all of that. And yeah, we can, happy to talk more in the Q&A. I just want to comment about this missing data set. Like, <coughs> I, I used to be in political party in, in Ontario, and so obviously in terms of winning the election, we collect lots of data. And I think the problem for us was, I mean, a lot of people, we do a lot of phone surveys, 
and they don't really give out a lot of information that we really need. So like the half of our data, it's like we don't have even a, like a correct name. The address is always missing and the phone number is not working. So I think the challenge is, it's really the, we don't have a mechanism. We force people to provide our data unless it's kind of government statistics. So I think there is, will be, there will be always some issue with the uh, missing data. However, the problem for us is that the, let's say we only have a 10% of a, like a respond, respondent who answer our, our survey. We have to make the decision based on that only 10%. And we are thinking, okay, this is like a, just the tip of iceberg. You know, like mm. the, at the business, like there is a bunch of those the data is hidden. And I have to tell you a couple of election was lost because we didn't really understand that hidden 90% mm. only was able to get that 10% of the data. So I, I think that's really interesting, the experience I had from my, my previous role. And it's really, I think, challenging for a lot of uh, companies, especially you're dealing with uh, like a consumer packaging good or a bunch of things that directly to the consumers. So thank you, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. That I've had lots of really good conversations with, like I have a whole group of statistician friends who I talk about this stuff a lot, and they understand this really well. They're like this, it's the missing, the things that are missing are not a bug, like they're a feature. That, and so I think a lot of what I've been trying to do is really connect that back to say that that's not, that's, we don't live in a world in which you can understand every, like you will have everything, you, you won't. That is sort of the reality of things. My, um, this reminds me also, I have a friend who works with, uh, in the UK, with NHS, and she talked about surveys they collect and this need, this tension that they always see, where they, if they, they said we can get the most, to get the most accurate, oh, I'm gonna see if I can get this right, to get the most accurate information, they needed to ask people about uh, their like sexual health, STIs, and so on, but they know that if they ask about those questions, fewer people will respond, but if they don't ask, then they will get way more participation, but not the information that they need. And so this, like bringing this back into the conversation, where you're like this, the collection process is actually very deeply tied to that data. And so I think that your experience kind of speaks to that. But it is important for us to bring those stories out here just so that we can have a fuller understanding when we are talking about like, data used in social context. Yeah, great. Any other questions? Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just sort of have a question based on some of the things that just touch upon in the presentation, and it will be, how would you balance this desire of um, that you especially see in some of the machine learning research right now, that is sort of like, how do you balance the collaboration or the desire to help by adding certain features uh, through the collection and the harm that you can also inflict by these particular processes of data collection? So how should we approach a balance between the two? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that just, that is a question that I think is really context specific, depending on what exactly you are working on. Because I do think that these questions of, like the question of harm seems quite wide, but actually it's very, like it's different for different groups in different moments. I think a lot about threat modeling, uh, which is, you know, sort of like modeling your kind of like privacy and security and how like Edward Snowden's threat model in terms of like who, who he was trying to protect himself from is very different than like a teenager's threat model, which might just be their parents. They're trying to protect information from them. And so I think this conversation around harms, it's, it is, has to be really like contextually located. And so even like large answers, I'm very wary of giving like what is the best way to do that. I do think that this, keeping in mind that that is a thing that happens, that, that, is, that is a tension that has to be like held, you know, in two hands is like step one to it, but then step two is sort of, all right, well, let's like dive into the specifics for this particular situation and all the ways in which we could see this being like launched and who it would affect. 
Yeah, I think we can we can hear you. Right. Yeah, I think they're, they're usually something that I often point people to is the engine rooms responsible data practice. They have a whole kind of like list of things around this, which some of them we spoke about a bit yesterday, just in general like this, A, data minimization, so collect the least that you can, be embedded within the people who you're, who you're collecting data from, make it clear that they know what it's being used for and that they know how long it lasts and they have access to it. There's, they have sort of a whole list, like checklist around this. And I think something that's nice is that you are, uh, I'm speaking really, that's for like nonprofit and kind of development spaces. I'm sure corporate environments have a different, a similar like checklist of what you, what you should keep in mind for this. But there is like a larger piece of this. I think about a lot in regards to the US Census in 2020, which is a thing that some people in circles I've been in are very, very concerned about. So they're like, well, we, getting this data about people is super useful and it's very useful for thinking about funding and thinking about policy decisions in the future. At the same time, people are really justified in not wanting to give that data, to, to like have that data be collected. And there's a long history of why people might not want that. And you have to deal with both of those at the same time. So I've seen some interesting kind of ways in which people are trying to deal with it. I don't think there's a clear answer. Again, this is why I say it's like really particularly context dependent. You wanna start with these rules for, okay, this is what we should do, but also understand that there isn't, often I think we search for like, well, what is the best way to do it? And that, that's the issue, we don't know. That's the thing is we're trying to kind of work it out as we go along the way. But fortunately, a lot of smart people are thinking about it. So there's at least, like we have, we have material to draw from. Hi, um, you were giving uh, mostly examples of um, missing data which is visible. I was wondering if you could comment on um, missing data which is hidden and, um, and embedded in, um, in other data which we don't um, really understand um, much about its level of accuracy. I mean, some of that was already mentioned two questions ago, but um, I mean brought up in terms of the political um, surveys, but um, what about all of our data? All of our data um, and statistics probably has did hit, hidden missing uh, data in it, um, embedded in it, and how that affects the data or um, how we will discover that or um, how that relates to the visible, the visible versus the hidden in what terms of what, what is, uh, what um, uh, the two, two pro problematic aspects of this. What is your distinction between hidden and invisible? No, sorry, hidden and visible. The right, ones, sorry, the what examples you gave were that they are document they are documented. You, ah, you showed them. I see. Um, I'm talking about this is data that is this is missing data. You you showed examples of missing data. I'm talking about um, data uh, no, um, the the missing um, stuff is in, embedded in the data collection. So it's not there, but it's it's factored in as as. Maybe, maybe there's a point of confusion there. Anyway, if you can speak. To I think, yeah, well tell me, if I'm, tell me if I'm right. It seems like you're talking about the things that we know we don't know versus what we don't know we don't know. Sort of, yeah. Hmm, okay. So I think that this is, this is interesting. I think this, like, this is also built into it. I'm sorry, the reason I was kind of pushing back on you is because I think that I've sort of personally, well first off, I'll start at one point and then I'll get to the second thing. But just even the terms like hidden versus visible, because I'm in a like media art space, a lot of people talk about like revealing the invisible and whatever. And now 
I realized that actually nothing, this like question of what's visible versus invisible doesn't really exist. It's just about where you are located and what you see. So for instance, with the missing data sets, they're documented because someone someone has some like that that line between them being known and not known is actually very poor like very thin and so there's this funny something i talk about i have i haven't posted them but i have this whole list of all these missing data sets hundreds at this point but for all of them i kind of have a link as to how i know it's missing and sometimes people are like that's really interesting that metadata that you can't be like oh it just is it's just not there and i'm sure like i have to i'm like well i know because of this thing or this person or whatever i, I actually think the distinction is elsewhere i think it's in um, whether um, the, the data has been, um, the hidden data has been assimilated into the wider data. Um, not just that it exists, but it's been assimilated, but falsely assimilated because it's a blank spot. Like a study just came out, or, or it, it's a known thing now that a lot of medical um, research has been done using um, men, um, and, and applied to the whole population, which consists of men and women. So there's an example of um, hidden data that was right. embedded in a data set as, as hidden. It was hidden, but it was not declared as, I mean, right. it, it was absent. Let's call it absent data yeah, embedded no, I hear you. in, in, um, uh, um, in research. I hear you. I think, but really, some of this is just a frame, how you frame it. Because there's a way where you, this exact same thing you're talking about, we could just say what was missing was that data specifically for women. There's so, some of, I see what you're saying, and I think that it is sort of, it's important not to get too caught up in the semantics of what part, like which part is missing and what is it embedded in. To me, again, it's much wider, it's about this wider system of what we actually prioritize mm -hmm. and why it is that we find this truth in having some of these things, even when that, something that we cannot get. So I often try to take a step back. I think that, what you're asking, really is, it's, it, it's just a frame of how you look at it. But there's another thing I will say. This is what I was gonna get to before. Um, something, I just, I did this, uh, wrote a thing on a project that the Human Rights Data Analysis Group did with Data Civica and I think it's like Universidad de Ibero Iberoamericana, I don't know, something like that. This university in uh, Mexico, where they were trying to figure out, they're this like machine learning um, tool for figuring out where missing people in Mexico were most likely to, to be. And so they were, they, it's actually a really great project. It's one of my favorite examples of machine learning in a civic sense. Where, so they were able to say, okay, these are the, the like counties that are most likely to have graves of disappeared people. And they, and it's actually, and it's still, they're still working on this, it's quite cool. Uh, like I said, there's an article, if you're interested, you can find it online. But something that they really specify within it, they're like, look, there is, this is not the place, this is not all of the counties that are likely to have this uh, missing people. It's the ones that we know because we can only get this from the data that we already have. So this is like the known, the known unknowns, but there's a whole section of this that we can't even get at because it is just embedded within, they're hidden, these ones are hidden so well that we haven't even found them. And that is part of this. And so there, this is why I say this is a framing issue. There, what they do really well is that they're like, look, this is not all of them, this is the ones that we have the data, the ones that we can do this for. And that is different than saying that this is, this is an AI like application that's going to solve all of these problems everywhere. This, I think, actually is kind of closely related to some of the things you're talking about, but we should talk about this later on if it's not. Like I said, I think, really, in the time I've spent doing this, some of this is just how you, how you talk about it, how you frame it, and that a lot of the pushback that I even, that I, the thing that I try to push back on is not in saying like, oh, AI isn't gonna solve, I think AI is super exciting, I think machine learning is really exciting in a lot of different ways, but that there's, the issue is when you take something that refers to a part and then you say that's the whole. That is a thing that you see often. And that's the thing that, that is like the, to me, the sort of distinction that is really most crucial to the question you're asking. Basically, we, we should realize that um, this missing data, and I really should have called it missing data rather than hidden data, maybe that's more accurate to uh, you know, being clear, but um, that um, it affects um, the 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 uh, statistics and the and the data more than we might think. So that's something that we need to be more aware of, right? Without knowing exactly what it is that is mm. skewing the data. Mm. Yeah, we can. Like I said, we can talk more about it afterwards. But yeah. Hi, Mimi. Uh, I have a question that delves on ethics and possibly deviance to an extent. Mm. But in your opinion, do you find that data collected from somebody without their knowledge is more accurate than data collected with their knowledge because they can't lie necessarily? 
data collected without their knowledge is more accurate than data collected with their knowledge because they can't lie. Mm. What do you mean by that? Uh, I'm just thinking back to the, the hate crime statistics with the FBI. If, uh, if this database was able to collect those statistics just based off information that was dug out from their metadata, for example, hmm. then there's no disputing that. And there's no him versus her, or your word versus their word. Mm. So it's, it's just by the facts, where AI is very black and white, and it's just the, these are the stats. It's very data-driven, as opposed to emotion-driven. Yeah, no, I don't think that. Um, <laughs> I think the hate crime one is, is, is actually, it's a really good, I'm glad you bring that up, because I think it's a good example for talking about this, which is that there's this, this, like that, some, how do I even say it? It's that it's not so much that one, like this question of accuracy in a space, because a lot of the things I talk about are social data sets. So they have to do with things, something like hate crimes. What is there, like there's this question of what, what is a hate crime, really? How do you define this? And we do have definitions. We do say like this is what it counts as, as whatever. But there, you get into this area where actually you, it's hard to define, like you, you, you can't, and what you might say, well, that, that definitely is a hate. Someone else could be like, well, actually, that's not. And this is the thing that I think gets sort of like uncomfortable to talk about. What I often see is the ways in which data is leveraged by people who already like have power in a situation to assert a type of accuracy or truth, and then to then wrap that into something and be like, yeah, this is just the data set. And like, I would know because I'm, I'm an impartial observer, but this, you know, come from an anthropology background where we know that there is no, that impartiality is a myth that doesn't really exist. It's something that gets, but it is something that gets encoded into like a particular perspective. So I wouldn't say this, like if something is collected without people knowing, it's more, like it's, it's more accurate. That's, I like this to me goes back into anthropology where we're like, no, no, it's, it's, these are different, but it's not, I wouldn't say more accurate. And even that, like the need to, the, the pursuit of accuracy in something where very much like your experience of it does, like is deeply related to the, to the data. How do we, that's the thing that's hard to make sense of. So I like, that's, this is part of why I like to talk about these moments of collection and the decisions you have to make to say, okay, this is how we're going to decide what this is versus what this is. Because the truth is once, that you, ha once you have a data set, then people will just see it as fact. And people will say, well, it's here. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. And we all, I mean, anybody who, who's worked with data before, I think, you know that we do this because you're like, oh, I got the data set. And then maybe you'll be like, oh, like just a, cu a few caveats, like this is how blah, blah, blah. But like deeply that, the, the artifact counts for way much more than any of the like contention in its collection process. Yeah, that was a long answer, but to say. Thanks mm. very much. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mimi. Um, I was wondering, uh, because last night we were talking a bit about the need for digital literacy when engaging with AI. Um, and today when talking about your people's guide to AI, you were talking about how you can address both equity and uh, technical issues mm. at the same time. Um, so what do you think is the best way to engage people on the topic of AI? Um, because a lot of us, like I think everyone in this room and everyone enrolled in, in the class is very interested, mm. um, but how can we reach the broader public? That is, I think that's a really good question. Um, something that I, I have a couple like different touch points for this. I think I talked about, I talked about this in y'all's class before, um, about one of the, one of like the, the one of the, okay, I'll, multiple things. One is the crypto party I went to. I'm sure I brought this up to y'all. Went to a, I don't know if y'all have ever been to a crypto party. Okay, great. They are not parties. <laughs> Let me warn you. They're not really parties. They're really just about like uh, being more secure uh, with your like messaging software or like how you, how you engage with the world. It's really like your, your, I don't know, you're like digital hygiene. And so these usually it'll be people kind of being like, look, this is like encrypted technology you can use, or this is like the best, this is how to do like some password protection or et cetera. And I remember someone at this crypto party event that I was at asked the people facilitating it. They were like, look, I'm really into this, but nobody around me is. So I don't know how, this is pre like, now I think a lot of people use Signal, the encrypted messaging app, but this was like years ago. They're like, I really like Signal, but nobody I know is going to get on this app because they're already on WhatsApp, they're already on like iMessage, they don't want to switch to something new. So how do I convince them that this stuff is really important? 
And what I thought the people were gonna say is they were, I thought they were gonna be like, here, here are the facts that you give them. This is what you do. Like tell them this many people get blah, 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 and like this, whatever. And they did not, the, the people at the crypto party leading it, they did not say that at all. They were like, tell them if they're Android users, that if they use this app, again, this is years ago, that like, if they use this app, messages that they send when they're on, offline will automatically be sent when they're online. And I thought that was so interesting because it has nothing to do with the main purpose of the, of the application. But what they were getting at with it is they were like, look, if people aren't really interested in this, you sort of need to meet them at the point where they are interested in it, and then we can get to, to talking about some of this. That was their, that's their perspective on it. They were like, well, don't, don't try to sell them on like, oh yeah, it's gonna like protect you from this and this, because if people don't care about it, then they don't care. Really meet them at the place where they do, and then once they get there, then be like, okay, let's work this into it. And so sometimes I think about this, because I think that in a lot of our, that this, like this, this idea is what you package into a thing that people use, and this is built into a lot of our, the tools that we use. So something like Facebook, of course, is like the reason why people are still on Facebook is because it is a useful tool for like events or for groups or so on. The reason, they might not wanna be on it because they're like, ah, oh, Cambridge Analytica, like I know, I know what's going on here, I know it's not great, but they will still stay on it because it provides some other use. And this is like what Facebook has done is packaged a lot of other things into this, this like shiny app. This is what pretty much is like at the heart of a lot of the work that various tech companies do. They're like, I'm gonna package this other idea, which isn't great, into something that you do need. And so I wonder, something uh, Diana and I, when we were working on that, on the People's Guide, part of the reason why we did start with like, we we're like, okay, we are gonna talk about equity, we are gonna talk about uh, these like kind of social implications, is because the people we were talking to, we knew were really into those topics. And so if we could start from that point, that was their experience, and that's the point where they'd be able to like draw the line, like cross the bridge, and be like, oh, okay, I see why. It's almost like, building out the context that they already understand and are deeply familiar with, so that then they can easily take that next step and say, okay, cool, I am interest now I am interested in, in AI. But this specifically is for people who aren't like at all into it, at all. And that is the, that's like the packaging where we're like, okay, we're gonna go to these events and we'll do, like we would do a lot of workshops, but we would do them at places, where, like we would go to people and then do them, do them at places where, like, cause we knew people might not wanna come. There's a lot of reasons why people feel like they shouldn't, like they're not part of technical conversations. So we do the work of trying to go to those places where they are there. So that's for people who feel like they can't, like they shouldn't enter those spaces. I think that we have to be the ones to go there and establish why it's useful. And that's part, partly from popular education as well. That's really different than people who already are interested in that stuff. But then those people are a self-selecting group. So in that way you kind of don't have to worry so much about getting them into it. It's more like, well, how do you just get them the information that they want to have? So yeah, it kind of depends on what direction you're moving in. But that's sort of my, like the, the thinking that I've now come into around it, having made the People's Guide. Thank you. Oh, that was amazing. Um, I think it was, uh, it was quite an honor to have Mimi contribute to this class, and I think we all learned a lot from her. I made a, I made a few mistakes. I'm about to make a couple more. One is I forgot to bring my notepad in, so I was on my phone the whole time. Hope I wasn't I wasn't playing Candy Crush. I promise. Um, <laughs> So that was the first mistake. Second mistake is I'm about to read directly from this thing, but and the third mistake is I'm gonna talk about myself. I'm gonna start by talking about myself. So I'm a, I'm a professor in a faculty of arts at a school that um, promotes itself almost exclusively on its engineering and math uh, prowess. And that could make someone feel like they're part of a missing data set uh, pretty easily. Um, Nearly all the conversations we've had on this stage since Jaron Lanier's talk on Friday have been about the need to, um, the fact that we need more critically, critical and creative people um, to um, you know, confront the challenges of our technocratic culture. Amy's not just one of those people. Uh, she also has the capacity to render visible the missing data set of creative arts and make that part of a conversation. And she does that in ways that no machine learning application could come up with. So Mimi's not producing uh, paintings that look like Dutch portraits. Uh, she's doing something very different. And I also wanna say, in a way, it's, it's almost easy for, I'm gonna go out of a limb here. It's almost easy for someone like Jaron Lanier or Tristan Harris um, or Kai-Fu Lee to 
to basically talk from a critical perspective about technology. They're already at a privileged position in culture as tech jockeys. They're gonna make thousands and thousands of dollars just to give a talk about the dangers of AI and so on. It's much more difficult for someone who is not in that position to actually get up and become part of that conversation and to do it in such a brilliant and creative way. So um, I just really wanna point that out and point out that this is what really makes Mimi uh, such a, a cherished asset, though I don't wanna call you an asset, but um, man, if we could invest, we, we would invest. So thank you very much.